As the war in Ukraine rages on, Russia and its embassy here in Berlin seem as isolated from the West as ever, and peace seems to be an incredibly distant prospect. And yet one of Germany's top diplomats is saying that now is the time for Western countries and others to think about how to find peace. Wolfgang Ischinger used to chair the Munich Security Conference, perhaps the world's biggest gathering on international security. And he said that it's time for Western countries to start working out a diplomatic process that could lead towards peace and also to work out its positions on what a peace could look like. So we spoke to him to ask about scenarios of how you deal with the thorniest questions, bridge the unbridgeable in this war. We spoke to him here in Berlin. So Wolfgang Ischinger, um, thanks for speaking to DW. Now you've come up with this proposal saying that it's time to start thinking about how to organize a peace process uh, for the Ukraine war. Why are you saying this now? The one thing we must absolutely make sure is not going to happen. If and when a negotiation scenario appears on the horizon, and we don't know whether it will appear now or, or, or later, but if and when it does appear, we must not be confronted by such a scenario uh, uh, without being well prepared for it. So what I'm saying is, let's use the time now. Uh, while, of course, uh, negotiations between Russia and uh, Ukraine may be uh, something we'd like to see happen, but it's uh, obviously at this moment not something that's uh, in the cards for the foreseeable future. But I think we need to make sure that we are singing from the same song sheet. Are we singing from the same song sheet today, the United States, that the Biden administration, the, the United Kingdom, France, the entire European Union, NATO allies, Poland, the Baltic states? Um, are we in agreement about how we want, if and when a negotiating scenario appears, how we want to conduct it? Are we in agreement what our position would be? Let's assume Ukraine will unfortunately or might unfortunately not be able to re-liberate Crimea. From their point of view, it's Ukrainian territory and I would ag agree it's Ukrainian territory. So what are the options if they can't liberate by, by the use of military force uh, Crimea? Do we have options about a referendum, about um, uh, you know, postponing a decision about Crimea for a couple of years, uh, establishing a UN supervisory role for this part of territory. There are all sorts of possible options and we need to do our homework and be prepared for any and all such options. There's time now to do it. Uh, I want to make sure that we are going to be perfectly equipped to help Ukraine uh, uh, come up with the best possible solutions if and when a negotiating scenario is actually going to appear to be, to be, to be conducted. So I'd love to come back to some of those issues such as Crimea in just a moment. But, but first of all, okay, so essentially you're saying the world has to do its homework first so that it's ready when such a scenario comes up. Um, can you explain how you are arguing that this should be organized? Because you've come up with an image of, of an onion, of different layers uh, of, of communication between different players. Could you quickly talk us through uh, what your idea there is? So uh, what's the arrangement that I have in mind? Look, let's start with what we have. What I know we have is the so-called quad, not the uh, uh, Asia-Pacific Quad, that's in the news at, at the moment, but the traditional uh, NATO Quad, that is the United States, France, the United Kingdom, and Germany. That Quad has existed for decades, uh, and it's, it actually exists, and it works, right? Around that, my proposal would be to create an arrangement that is um, of, of course, composed of diplomats, senior diplomats, uh, just like the Ramstein meeting of military leaders and specialists, where they discuss military deliveries, coordinating uh, how, we be, how we can best help Ukraine 
conduct the military operations. So uh, what I'm suggesting is let's use the exact, more or less the exact same number of countries that participate in the Ramstein format militarily to have a uh, circle of countries that, dis that can discuss the options that may appear on the horizon going forward in the diplomatic, political, strategic arena. And my, and my additional idea would be to try, now that's the hard part, and I'm not sure to what extent that could be successful, but I think we should make an effort to include in such deliberations to the extent that that's going to be possible. Countries like India, countries like Brazil. Brazil, Lula has actually offered to, to play a role, has he not? Um, and I would even, you know, uh, make a phone call to Xi Jinping and suggest, is China interested? Or does China want to be absent from such discussions? Your choice. So that would be my outer circle of countries that may or may not decide to, uh, to, to be included or associated with such a preparatory effort. So, so, so these are the layers of the onion that you've exactly. described. Yeah, so you have at the core the, yes. what you describe as the quad, of course, the United States, Germany, France, and the UK. Outside that, then you have more European countries, such as uh, Poland and the Baltic states. And outside that, then you have uh, countries from, from the rest of the world. Um, if I was sitting in Poland, I might be thinking, well, why am I not in that core? Why is this core the kind of old guard of old Europe um, together with the United States? Well, Isn't just, this a little bit like old-fashioned thinking? Well, uh, I mean, you know, facts are facts. The Quad exists. As I said, let me repeat, the Quad has existed uh, even when Poland was still a member of the Warsaw Pact in the 1970s and during the Cold War and it, could, it continues to this day. So can we ignore this uh, nuclear, uh, nucleus, the quad? No, we can't, because it, it already works. That's the only part of my scenario that actually exists as we speak. Uh, and I'm not in any way interested in, um, in, in shoving Poland or any of the other neighbors of Ukraine, our partners, to the side. That would, would be a total a uh, mistaken um, appreciation of, of my suggestion. Um, in Rammstein, believe me, there, are, there is also an inner circle of those countries that can do more for, um, for Ukraine militarily and other countries uh, can do less. There are small countries that provide enormous help given their small size, like Estonia. Uh, there, there are countries like Poland that are neighbors of uh, uh, of course, of Ukraine that uh, make a huge effort. So I think we should consider this Rammstein, political Rammstein group that I envisage as a, as a group of equals uh, to, um, to discuss the options. And, and, uh, and it would be entirely wrong to consider that uh, we would keep, we want to keep Poland or any of the Baltic states out of, uh, or keep them in the fringes of, of the discussion. That would be, uh, uh, that would be, uh, that would be wrong. I but, think but, that but, would but be. Can you, excuse me for, for butting in, but can you, imagine, can you understand, you know, an observer from Poland looking at this and thinking, well, you know, I'm not in the, I want to be in the core of this onion. Why am I in the second layer? Sure, if I were a Pole, I would say uh, we are, uh, one of the most important countries. So if I were a Pole, I would say, let's create this group, this, this political strategic Rammstein group tomorrow morning, and let's have the first meeting in Warsaw. That would be my suggestion. And if my Polish friends would, uh, would make that suggestion, I, as a German, I would say, great, let's do it. Now let's talk also about China, because China is obviously, it, it, it has come, a, come along recently with what it calls a position paper on its view of how to achieve peace in Ukraine. Um, so the position paper has been viewed with some skepticism in the West as, as having quite a, you know, some fairly strong implicit support for Russian positions within it, but it's there. How do you see what you describe as potentially, is it in competition with the Chinese proposal? Can it 
Can it dovetail with it? How can you get these kind of movements working together? Well, let me make a couple of points. First, I think it would be a big mistake, a diplomatic error, uh, if we decided to ignore the Chinese paper. I agree, the Chinese paper is not a peace plan, it's just a list of, 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 of rather abstract positions. Um, and there are points, there is at least one point among the 12 points which I think would be quite unacceptable uh, to Western negotiators. Uh, that's the point about sanctions, where China argues that it is unlawful under international law for the West um, to slap sanctions on, 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 on Russia without proper UN Security Council uh, entitlement. But when you look at the other points in the Chinese paper, I think they are not totally useless at all. I'll give you an example. There is the point where China repeats their statement that every member country of the United Nations deserves, uh, uh, of course, that its territorial integrity be respected. What China doesn't say in that, in that uh, paragraph is, therefore, Russia needs to withdraw their troops from the territory of Ukraine. But that's actually just um, you know, the implication of the fundamental sentence. So I would say, let's go back to the Chinese lists and, and, and let's discuss this particular paragraph. Are you Chinese going to agree if I say this paragraph in the Chinese paper means concretely that Russia should withdraw from Ukraine? Yes or no? Second uh, 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 point is where uh, the Chinese paper says, no, 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 uh, there must never be a threat of the use or the use of nuclear weapons. Um, well, of course, Ukraine doesn't have nuclear weapons. So the threat or the use of nuclear weapons can only reasonably be applied to Russia. So again, here again, I would go to my Chinese friends and say, can we agree that what your sentence means is that we call on Russia to stop threatening the use of nuclear weapons? Yes or no? So in other words, I think there is something in this position, Chinese position paper that's worth starting a discussion with the Chinese. Maybe we can get them uh, to agree to a sentence that goes at least a millimeter, half an inch further uh, than the text of their paper. Um, I think we, it's, it is in our interest to try to make sure that China isn't going to move closer to Russia and maybe, I hope I'm not too optimistic here, maybe we can convince China to move just a little bit in our direction instead of moving closer to Russia. So just at the recent Munich Security Conference, you interviewed China's top lip diplomat. You got some time with him. What do you think China wants out of this? What, what, what does it see as a good outcome from this war? Well, I don't want to go into speculation about, uh, about Chinese intentions. But it appears to me rather quite clear that given the current confrontational atmosphere between the United States and China, there are relatively little incentives from a Chinese point of view um, to, um, to reduce their affiliation with Russia at this, at this point. I think the Chinese view appears to be, while we have this confrontation with the United States, this, this, this rather bad tempered approach, um, uh, it's actually good for China uh, to have Russia on our side. And we don't want the distance between China and Russia to be increased. I think that's the fundamental thought. It may also be an additional Chinese thought that um, if this war drags on, and if, if Russia is weakened militarily, economically, 
politically, uh, Russia may become even more dependent or will become even more dependent on China. And as a Chinese decision maker, you might also conclude that that's also not a bad a development from a Chinese point of view. On the other hand, I am quite convinced that it is not, um, it does not create much joy in the minds of Chinese leaders to think about you know, this war as something which is going to last uh, not only through the year 2023, but maybe uh, longer, um, and with continuing threats about uh, escalation, threats about eventual use of nuclear weapons, because at some point, other countries may actually ask the question of China, how is it possible that you allow your partner Russia to threaten the use of force, do something about it. So I think that at some point this can, be, can become a rather uncomfortable situation for China that wants to be seen by the rest of the world, by the global south, as the champion of the global south, not only as an ally of Russia. Um. So that kind of sets the landscape. Let's have a look at a couple of the issues that, that any peace process would have to tackle because they, they, are, they, they appear incredibly difficult, of course. Um, let's talk about, first of all, um, territory. So uh, the Russians have said that they have now annexed not merely Crimea, but four further um, uh, Ukrainian regions into its territory, even though they don't have full control of those. Under the Russian constitution, Vladimir Putin is not allowed to give up um, territory that is, in their eyes, now part of the Russian Federation. What would be possible ways of getting around that? Because that sounds pretty much as big a dead end as you could think of. Well, look, you raise the territorial issues, which is, of course, um, an obvious uh, important question. But the territorial issue between Russia and Ukraine is the, is the one issue that is, of course, by far the most difficult to resolve. And you've pointed out uh, at least one of the difficulties, Russian constitutional law, etc., etc. So in my view, uh, if there will ever be meaningful negotiations, and of course we don't know if and when those might happen, the territorial question that you're raising here will be the last one on the agenda. There will be so many other issues. Uh, who controls, if there is a border uh, that is not the traditional Russian-Ukrainian border, who's going to monitor that? We've, made, we've had the experience of a process monitored by OSCE for the last eight years. That so, so that's that, the, organization. the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, that process was, let's say, less than perfect. Uh, OSCE was not sufficiently well equipped to prevent uh, regular shooting across this line for both sides, really. Uh, so how can we build on that? What, might the United Nations have a role? Uh, or what other options uh, are there. So the territorial issue is the most important one, but it's not the one that would uh, that you would want to start a, a process with. That's the one that you would tackle when all the other issues are going to be resolved. Okay. So the, yeah, I mean that's an interesting insight into way, the way diplomacy works, isn't it? That you start with the logical, I suppose, the lowest hanging fruit, and then you get to the exactly. tougher stuff later. Um, but the, the West and certainly Ukraine, I mean, they've argued very much from first principles that, that, that this is um, that uh, Ukraine's territorial integrity has, has been undermined and must be restored. And certainly Ukraine's position uh, is officially, and most Western countries at least verbally uh, support this, that Ukraine shouldn't just get back these eastern regions, it should even get back Crimea. I know this is the most difficult issue, but I want to talk about this because I think this interests people. You have the Russians saying, no way will we ever give up anything that we've annexed. Uh, Ukraine and the West saying, there's no way that that can be accepted. 
How, as a diplomat, do you bridge what appears to be unbridgeable? Well, um, you're right. At this moment, as we speak, there appears to be, appear to be unbridgeable differences. Uh, maximalist Russian views, but also extremely ambitious Ukrainian views, if you, if you wish. Uh, I'm sure that uh, one of the decisive factors in how these questions will be addressed at the end of the day uh, will be the military developments, which is why uh, if we want to move closer to a negotiating scenario, we need to do much more than we've done in, in recent months to help Ukraine re-liberate more of the occupied territories. Quite a, that's obvious, and I hope that everybody in the Western camp agrees to that, including my own government, which uh, has, of course, done more recently, uh, but which, in my view, has not done enough throughout uh, the year 2022. I hope we, le we learn a lesson. Uh, it's not in our interest to have the military operations go on for years and years and years. It is in our interest to see a military success uh, liberating the occupied territories to the maximum extent possible by Ukraine, hopefully this year. Will that happen? I don't know. But that's the desirable military development. And it will depend on the outcome of these military developments this year, hopefully not, not over a period of several years, uh, that then the territorial question can or will be or must be addressed. It will depend on to what extent Ukraine is going to be in charge of these territories or to what extent Russia can say, uh, we declare this to be ours, and it remains ours, and our armed forces are there, and we're not going to give it up. Uh, so, in other words, this territorial question will be decided primarily, I'm afraid to say, on the battlefield. <coughs> and then the result of what we see on the battlefield at the end of the day, if and when a ceasefire appears possible, uh, then the negotiations begin. So, so, as you say, it's essentially, this is now being worked out on the battlefield to an extent, and then the negotiation comes. Um, so that people can think about potential scenarios. I mean, it's not necessarily only a black or white, Ukraine has all of its territory restored, Russia gets to hold on to uh, its uh, supposed annexations. There are, and you mentioned this earlier, potential ways in which certain areas, for example, Crimea, could be in more of a grey zone. Can you just explain? A referendum in a, 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 in a territory that is contested is a classic method, method of clearing, uh, of, of, of resolving such a dispute. If, and that's a big if, both parties accept the referendum and, of course, the modalities of the referendum. I'll give you an example. After World War II, one part of Germany, the Saarland, the Saar, uh, was controlled by France. And it was only in the 1950s that a referendum was held in the Saar, which uh, produced an overwhelming pro-German result. And the Saar was returned by France to Germany 10 years after uh, World War II. So there are historic examples of how um, such transactions can take place, but they require, of course, a previous kind of peace arrangement to convince the Ukrainians that a referendum, for example, in certain parts of the Donbas, would be in the Ukrainian interest, Ukrainian interest because the Ukrainians would say most of the inhabitants uh, will have fled from these territories and only some, um, some inhabitants uh, who were willing to support the Russian occupiers are still there. So the result of a referendum um, is predictably going to be a pro-Russian outcome because, of, uh, because the majority of people is no longer there. So you're going to have a question of can 
we create a situation where those who, who left the area could be returned, could return to the area in order to participate in such a referendum. These are questions re that require a lot of time. It's not something that you can negotiate at a negotiating table in a couple of weeks. So it's complicated, not inconceivable, but um, at this moment, for me, extremely diff hard to see how um, in the foreseeable future something like this could work. So those are some of the challenges in terms of territory. Let's talk about one other area um, of any potential negotiations, which would be security guarantees for yeah. Ukraine. Yeah. Ukraine, obviously, at the end of this war, is going to need some kind of assurance that, that it's not just going to happen all over again in a few years. Um, none other than Henry Kissinger quite recently said that he thought Ukraine would have to end up in NATO, which is um, what it had, had certainly uh, called for in the past. Um, how realistic a scenario do you think that is as an outcome of any negotiations? Or what would be the kind of lesser kind of security guarantees that might uh, potentially emerge? Well, I think the NATO question is, of course, uh, going to be, in any, in any conceivable scenario, an important negotiating item. Either Ukraine insists and the West insists that Ukraine must, have the, must continue to have the right to join NATO, either now or later, or, uh, and that was also hinted at, at least by President Zelensky early on uh, when the war started, that Ukraine might regard the NATO question as a negotiating element. Um, in other words, the question would be, if we, don't, we Ukrainians don't insist on NATO membership, what would Russia be prepared to give in, in exchange? At the summit in Bucharest in April of 2008, NATO decided not to offer to Ukraine and Georgia immediate membership, but the, wor the wording was, Ukraine and Georgia will be members of NATO without a date given. And we have, we NATO members, we have repeated that particular sentence at each and every single NATO summit meeting since. In other words, that's on the agenda and it would be a big mistake for us to drop that. So let's leave it to Ukraine to decide whether they want to use this as a negotiating element or whether they want to insist on NATO membership. But, now comes a big but. The most immediate security guarantee that I can envisage for Ukraine would be the strength of the Ukrainian armed forces in a post-war situation. Imagine uh, a ceasefire or a peace arrangement between Russia and Ukraine, hopefully this year or, or next year. Imagine then the Ukrainian armed forces that would then exist, by far the most, the best trained, most experienced, um, and most capable armed forces in Europe by next year equipped with the most modern equipment from anything between tanks and electronic equipment and surveillance, uh, uh, etc., et and reconnaissance and intelligence, etc. So I think if you think of, you know, deterring Russia from, uh, from, from, from future ag aggressive acts, NATO membership surely would be a very important element. But an equally important element, in my view, would be the creation, which is, which is going to happen, uh, of a superbly equipped and superbly trained and superbly supported uh, Ukrainian army. What about any potential guarantees that were lower than the NATO threshold, but with other countries, say Western countries, each saying, well, if there is an attack, then we commit ourselves to a certain well, level of defense. Is it, may I just, would, that, would those be guarantees where you could also imagine other non-European countries, non-Western countries, also playing a role, also guaranteeing uh, Ukraine security? 
Well, put yourself in the minds of, a, of an Ukrainian political or military decision maker. If there is going to be no direct immediate NATO membership, what would be the second best solution from an Ukrainian point of view? If I put myself in the shoes of my Ukrainian friends, I'd say, I need a bilateral guarantee from Washington, D.C. That's all that matters. Forget the French, forget the Germans, uh, forget most of the other Europeans. It's America that matters. There's one caveat, though. Does Ukraine have a guarantee that there will eternally be a Joe Biden administration in Washington, D.C., friendly to Ukraine? Does, can Ukraine rely permanently uh, on, um, on, 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 on the certainty that there is not going to be a second Donald Trump type of guy sitting in the White House who might say our interests, U.S. interests, do not absolutely require uh, the protection of Ukraine? We have other interests vis-a-vis uh, -vis China and Russia, etc., in other areas. In other words, from from my, if I put myself in the Ukrainian shoes, I would say, I want the guarantee from the US, but in addition, I'd like to have a couple of other reliable guarantees uh, bilaterally. That could be guarantees including from countries, neighboring countries like Poland. Uh, I hope that uh, Germany and France and the United Kingdom could maybe team up bilaterally and, uh, and join such a, a guarantee club, let's call it that, uh, which would not be of the exact same quality as the um, international credibility of a of full NATO membership would, would amount to, but it would, it, it would be sort of a halfway house uh, on the way to a, a, a NATO membership. But again, let me, let me add a caveat here as a diplomat. Look, when NATO enlargement was first negotiated in the 1990s, we took great care, we Western countries, we took great care to take into account the concerns and security interests of the Russian Federation, which is why we negotiated, and I personally participated in the, those negotiations, the so-called NATO-Russia Founding Act of 1997 which guaranteed, which gave certain security guarantees to Russia. Namely, we promised never to deploy nuclear weapons to any future NATO members in the East. <coughs> there are, of course, American nuclear weapons in Germany, but there are no American nuclear weapons, as far as I know, in Poland or in Estonia, uh, etc. That's what we promised. And we also promised, in order to make Russia feel comfortable with the idea of NATO enlargement. We promised that there would be no large-scale um, military deployments in these future uh, member countries. In other words, when you think about, when you think these things through Ukrainian NATO membership, um, I think Emmanuel Macron had a point when he raised the question some time ago, well, what about Russian security interests? Let's assume peace has broken out. Uh, does Russia have security interests when NATO is uh, sort of directly at the Russian border? And to what extent could we take such interests into account without endangering again our Ukrainian future NATO uh, member? Interesting questions, too early to address here, but I think uh, just by raising the question, uh, you will understand that I find it Im Im immensely important that we start thinking these issues through among Western countries, not publicly at this moment, but in a confidential brainstorming kind of process. And just a final question. You, you mentioned uh, Donald Trump earlier and his skepticism uh, about support for Ukraine. Uh, we've also just heard from Ron DeSantis, his, his kind of strongest challenger within the Republican Party, a pretty similar line, sort of questioning whether it's really in America's yeah. interest to, to get um, any more involved in this. How worried about, uh, are you about this potential 
very significant question mark over future US policy with an election coming next year? Well, look, I, I am I'm not especially worried at this moment because I think the Biden administration is a safe bank for Ukraine. But there is, of course, going to be an election in 2024 that's only uh, a year and a half away, and we don't know what the outcome of that will be. Which is why, uh, given the uh, voices among the, in the Republican Party, given the voices in Europe, in Germany and elsewhere, from the German left, but also from the German far right, that raise the exact same questions as uh, Mr. DeSantis raises in Florida. Uh, is it really in our interest to support Ukraine that much? Uh, this is exactly why I believe that starting the kind of brainstorming preparatory process that I outlined in my recent article would be immensely helpful because we could uh, we, the Biden administration, the Scholz administration in Germany, we can uh, respond to these increasingly critical questions from, uh, from those who are opposed to uh, weapons deliveries to Ukraine. We can tell them, look, we have a process. And as soon as there is a willingness and a readiness by Russia to start a serious negotiation, uh, ending this war, we're going to be well prepared. Uh, we have all the options worked out. Wolfgang Nischinger, thanks very much for speaking to us today. Thank you.